Welcome to the chapel of the Diocese of Central Florida as I offer some brief reflections on the lessons and collect appointed for the fifth Sunday of Easter. And so I would like to begin by offering that collect, that prayer now. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Gospel lesson today from the 14th chapter of John is a familiar one. Jesus offers these words that we hear actually more often than not at funerals. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I know that my experience of what it means to be a Christian walking with Jesus is that I often say to Jesus, I'm not sure I know the way. I think I know who you are. You and your graciousness have revealed that, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In you is eternal life. In you, I have the promise of forgiveness of sins, a place with you in heaven. But how I get from A to B, the, the way, I'm not often sure that I know what that is. And that can particularly be what we are feeling now because things that we thought were the way that we should go, whether we're talking about financially, whether we are talking about even the matter of medicine and life and death, who lives and who dies, are things that we face that we don't know. We live in an era which, at least for the generations living, is an unprecedented time of financial, emotional, relational, economic, and even political upheaval. And it's compounded by the fact that everybody has a grand narrative that they want to tell you, if you listen to me, I'll tell you what the truth is. Don't believe those people over there, <laughs> whoever those people are. And it happens across the political and socioeconomic spectrum. No one, quite frankly, is immune. Everyone is claiming to have the best insider information and we, who are used to, as an educated people, understanding that the way you master a situation is to get the best information, are extraordinarily gullible to those very Barker calls, in my opinion, about what are we to think, and as a result, how are we to live? And when Jesus responds the, to his to Thomas's question, Lord, show us the way, which is certainly what comes out of my heart from time to time, it's not always evidently satisfactory for Jesus not to give Thomas facts. Instead, he offers something I'm sure that for Thomas, and certainly for most readers of the gospel, is an unexpected response. He doesn't offer as it were, a game plan, in so many words. Instead, he offers a relationship, and out of that relationship, a way of seeing life. That doesn't offer us all of the answers, 
as much as it invites us into a relationship of both trust and knowledge. In other words, he's teaching us something about how to live, not by a formula that we master, but by a relationship that over time masters us. That's not something that we're used to. We understand mastery is something to be avoided if it is imposed upon us. As people say, particularly in the light of the rejection by some of wearing face masks, none of us likes other people to tell us what to do. The last thing we want is to be mastered. We instead want to be the ones who master, who direct, who control, who tell other people what to do, who define reality for other people. And we think that if we can speak those words confidently enough, then we'll get an audience, even if what we're saying is on its face close to ridiculous. <laughs> In some ways, that's a part of what is being proven by these competing grand narratives spoken with such utter confidence and shamelessly attacking those who do not agree. So we're invited into something different, something different that is being offered by any of the media outlets, something that is different than what is being offered by almost all of our politicians. It has to do with knowledge, yes, but knowledge that is in fact the fruit of not the mastery of facts so much as it is entering into a relationship that gives us the capacity to see life from a different perspective, but a perspective that promises the capacity to begin to know truth. And as any of us, most of us know, truth is always larger than facts. It's actually a way of seeing the world. And so what Jesus says to Thomas is, I am the way. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that he is inviting us in to a subservient relationship with Jesus, where we allow him as Son of God and Lord to direct us and to teach us and to shape us in that relationship. In other words, to follow him, to be with him, to get to know him, to learn to hear his words, be shaped by those words, invites us to both know him and the God that he embodies in a way that isn't possible any other way. And out of that, to be able to see life from his vantage point, who, of course, is the creator and the redeemer of the world. New Testament scholar by the name of Merrill Tenney puts it this way, which to me is as succinct as anything that I've ever read. Jesus is the way, quote, because he is the only one who has intimate firsthand knowledge of God and of humanity, not marred by human sin. He is the only one who has intimate first-hand knowledge of God and humanity not marred by human sin. What that means is what, when he teaches, when he speaks, and the way he lives comes from a perspective both on God and on life that is intimate, personal, and most of all, perfect. And in fact, in Jesus' life, perfection is redefined in a way that it can only invite us to know him. He is the truth because he is the only one who can speak truth. As the Son of God, Jesus is the only one who even defines the nature of what truth is, that the perfection of his nature, the capacity of his to live in an unmarred relationship with God, flows out of him, to use Jesus' own words, in a river of living water that speaks truth unparalleled by any other teacher. And therefore, we are invited to enter into that same fount of knowledge, both by apprehending through reading and studying, 
but more importantly than that, by receiving, allowing that truth to shape us and embody us as people, that actually begins to change the way that we see life. You see, I don't get up in the morning every day to read the Bible just so I can learn more about what it says, as if somehow my goal in reading the Bible is to master the teachings of Scripture. It's never that antiseptic. Quite the opposite. I get up in the morning to learn more about the one who loves me and to know more about how I am loved to learn more about how the world is through the lens of a God who loves the world and every single human being in it. You see, to be in a relationship with Jesus who is the truth means that we are being given the capacity to know the truth and to receive the truth. We feed on his words daily to learn the truth and be shaped by that truth. And as we are being shaped by that truth, we see gradually more and more all of life through the lens of that truth. And it is that truth that challenges at, to its core the grand narratives that we often hear on television and through the media. It gives us the capacity to step back, to ask difficult questions, to include in the lens of what we believe to be the truth Sometimes things that we like and sometimes things that we don't. Walter Brueggemann puts it this way, to live in Jesus is to be able to begin to actually see reality rather than ideology. The things that we have been taught are true, which may or may not be through the lens of Jesus, which means it gives us the courage actually to face both the best and the worst of life and to hold both of these, those things together as a definition of what life right now on this side of the resurrection actually looks like. I mean, for me, I saw it this week. I mean, just a couple of days ago, I'm sitting in my living room and I'm looking out on the front lawn and the driveway. Here came this huge caravan of high school students in cars. They had uh, the doors cracked the windows all the way down, the sunroofs open. People were standing on the seats through the sunroofs at 15 miles an hour with huge placards. And they were giving thanks for a teacher who lived in our neighborhood and what that teacher had meant to them over the course of their time in school. That kind of gratitude is very much a part of what life is like. And it is something to be warmly received and welcomed. Also, many of us know about the unfortunate, tragic story of the black man shot in a white neighborhood in Brunswick, Georgia by two unarmed off-duty police officers. And all of that raises about profiling and how all of that was, to the best of our knowledge now, not seriously investigated but covered up. Both of those things are true, you see, about the world in which we live. And to actually ignore either of those is to say something other than what reality is. But reality by, defined by a God who is in fact at work, even in the midst of the most tragic of circumstances, and calling us, particularly as Christians, who are men and women called to know the truth, to speak up about the truth, to live into what that truth is, both to commend the gracious as well as to condemn injustice. Both of those are very important, particularly now in the life in which we live. You see, he is the life because he is the only one who did more than live with the inevitability of death. Jesus conquered death and ended the curse of its inevitability. In fact, the way Jesus is, speaks in this passage, what he's actually doing is redefining the terms of life to say that the end of life is in fact, and what gives meaning to life, is that it doesn't just end in meaningless death. It is transformed by the eternal presence of Jesus in eternity so that there is, in fact, a 
place being prepared for us right now. But not only that, he is actually at work in us as he is the way to that destination, working in us to prepare us for the place that he is preparing. What is Jesus doing? Among other things, he is preparing us and even the world that he has redeemed for the place that he is preparing. Teaching us now what it means for wrongs to be made right, for sins to be forgiven, not only in our receiving forgiveness, but also the freedom to offer forgiveness and to let go of wounds and hurts, not as a way to deny their existence, but to affirm something larger and bigger, which is Jesus conquering death. We're invited into a way of living in this passage, a passage that gives us the capacity to trust Jesus, to grieve in the places where grief is invited, to rejoice in the places where joy is invited, to speak up, to hold before others the power of eternity that is at work even now, preparing us for the place that Jesus is preparing. That's what it means in the collect when it invites us to follow where he leads. So that I'm not mastering information. I'm being mastered by the one who is, knows, and commends, and even defines the truth. Be discerning, sisters and brothers. Ask Jesus to shape not just what you think, but your heart, that you might begin to see life more and more as Jesus sees it that we are being called into something that invites us to serve through his power, his river of living water flowing in and through us because we have said yes to him who is the way to the Father. Amen.